Marvel at the man who got ahead of himself, literally. Journey to a hotel that only takes reservations in another dimension. Fail your military training by stumbling into the Middle Ages. All this and more to refract, rehearse, and redefine reality. It's temporally terrorizing. It's momentarily maddening. It's this week's time warpy tincture of odd tonic. Welcome to the parlor. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Maxwell. Have a seat, dear guest, as your eyes adjust to the candlelight. Mm, I love the parlor by candlelight. It makes it feel like such a timeless space. Mm, and that's fitting, because tonight we are returning to the world of time abnormalities, parallel dimensions, and glitches in the fabric of space-time. We don't usually do shows that repeat a theme back to back, but we had so many time slip stories prepared for the first show that we, ironically, just didn't have time to get to them all. <laughs> Plus, we find time travel and glitch stories completely fascinating. Maxwell and I can never get enough, so we figured chances were pretty good that you felt the same way. So, in the flickering of the candlelight, let's meet some unsolicited witnesses who experienced a flickering in their realities. Tonight we'll explore a tale of three young men who stumbled centuries out of GPS range, a couple whose shock at the grocery store checkout had nothing to do with the price, <laughs> and we'll ponder the affordability of lodging in the past. But first, let's investigate an electronic baby monitor with a unique feature that was definitely not listed on its box. This comes to us from ThoughtCo.com. As usual, the long workday was coming to an end, and I was dutifully putting the last load of laundered clothes away in our bedroom when I heard a ruckus on the baby monitor just a few feet away from me. I thought it was strange when I knew my husband and toddler were both in the living room quietly watching TV as my two-year-old drifted silently off to sleep, curled in my husband's lap as he caught the evening news. The bedroom door was straight in front of me, and I could see all the way down the hall to my husband and son in the lazy boy chair as this ruckus over the monitor continued. It didn't take long for me to realize the sounds were very familiar. Earlier in the day, I was in my toddler's bedroom, putting a load of folded clothes into the drawers, and picked up some stray toys and books that weren't being played with at the time. As I was doing so, I was telling my son about the story of Jack and the Beanstalk for the first time. Now, I stood in disbelief as I heard the drawers being pulled open and shut, and the rustling of toys and books being put into their proper places. But I nearly fainted when I heard my son's voice over the monitor. I kept looking back and forth at my husband and now sleeping son in the chair in the living room, and the monitor sitting on my dresser that was literally replaying the specific events from earlier in the day. The monitor is a standard baby monitor bought from Walmart and is not a recorder, but instead monitors the sound coming from the room as they are happening at the present time only. I listened as my voice retold the story of Jack and the Beanstalk and listened with familiarity as my son responded in baby talk to the tale he had never heard before. The incredible part was all this happened five hours earlier on the same day. I quickly called my husband into the room as he listened to the last part of the story with my voice coming through the monitor and our son's coos and chuckles. He stood stunned and turned his head and looked at our sleeping son flopped peacefully over his shoulder. In disbelief, he asked, How in the... as his voice drifted off trying not to miss a thing. I just stared at him in the same disbelief, and we both just shook our heads. This has never happened before or since, and it became pretty clear from the beginning that we were listening to some kind of warp in time. I never imagined in a million years that I would be witness to it, and I must admit, if it should happen to you, it is indeed one of the most incredible moments one can ever experience. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> really? Gosh, from all the stories I've heard, I'm quite convinced baby monitors are just a beacon for strange activity. 
Do you think an audio monitor of any room would yield results? Or do you think the paranormal just loves babies? <laughs> well, not to frighten new parents out there, but I do think the paranormal is drawn to babies. Mm. But if you think about it, we do put a lot of creepy things in kids' rooms. Maybe mm. the paranormal is just drawn to that, you know, like Furbies. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> or um, uh, Teddy Ruxpin. <laughs> yes. And before that, the um, oh, the symbol clapping monkey <laughs> with the teeth and the bulging eyes. Why did they even make that? Oh, it's a classic. Kids love it. <laughs> we should do an experiment where we talk to a Furby through a baby monitor and just see what happens. <laughs> now you're just trying to summon something. <laughs> yeah, I'm just giving our guests bad ideas. <laughs> Let's move on to something more benign, like a trip to the grocery store. Uh, if we're discussing it, I'm sure there's nothing benign about it. <laughs> this is taken from the book Time Storms by Jenny Randalls. It was just a few days before Christmas in Glassboro, New Jersey, 1999, when Evelyn and her husband were to have a very unusual shopping trip. They arrived at ShopRite, a 24-hour grocery store, at 5.30 p.m., Needing to grab only a few things before the holidays, they went inside. The couple gathered their groceries in a shopping cart and deliberately headed down the freezer aisle last. This was to prevent the ice cream they selected from melting before they got home. They then immediately headed the checkout. Evelyn began placing the items on the counter, and when she set down the ice cream carton, its contents spilled all over. It had melted. The ice cream was replaced and they went outside to drive the short distance home. It was very cold, so they didn't dawdle, apart from briefly stopping to talk in the parking lot. When they got home with their groceries, they were stunned to discover that it was 11 p.m., five hours later than it should have been. Evelyn and her husband were positive that their shopping trip had barely lasted an hour. They were so baffled that they investigated every way possible to discover what had happened. They even asked ShopRite to go over their security videotapes. Nothing odd was found. Video footage showed that they had arrived at the shop at 5.30 p.m. and left five hours later, despite having no understanding of how they could have lost so much time doing what was supposed to be a quick grocery run. Uh, this story fascinates me in how something so completely inexplicable can happen quietly and seamlessly in the most mundane of places, mm. like the middle of a grocery store between the freezer aisle and checkout, an invisible time warp. How are you supposed to prepare yourself for something like that? You can't. And, and personally, I just find it so unsettling because you know how much I hate grocery shopping oh, no. <laughs> and now i have this fear that i will never make it out of the frozen food aisle you'll really use any excuse won't you darling <laughs> yes <laughs> well uh don't worry before we go shopping we'll just tie a rope around you like they did to retrieve carol ann <laughs> oh our fellow shoppers can look at the rope and speculate for themselves <laughs> what our scenario might be between each other <laughs> Spicy. <laughs> well, funny enough, we have in our next story three boys who probably would have appreciated the option of a safety tether. <laughs> this classic tale comes from Slips in Time and Space by Rosemary Ellen Guiley. In 1957, three young men, all aged 15, had recently signed up to join the British Royal Navy. As part of their early training, they were set up with a map reading and coordinates finding task. They were to navigate on foot across about five miles of English countryside. Their target location was the tiny village of Kersey in Suffolk. None of the three boys were familiar with the area. William was from Perthshire, Scotland, Michael from Worcestershire, and Ray was a native of East London. Using their training, they followed the map coordinates given to where they were supposed to be, the village of Kersey, a lovely, peaceful, and picturesque village known for its delightful old-world charm and welcoming atmosphere. Upon approaching Kersey, an almost overwhelming feeling of strangeness came upon the three adventurers. The boys said an oppressive mood invaded their minds. All three agreed that a penetrating sense of depression and subtle fear had inexplicably descended upon them. 
It was a brisk October day when they reached Kersey, but as they walked into the village, they found it verdant, with green trees and long, lush grass. It seemed more like a warm spring day. You know, to me, I'm just too much of a curious person. Hmm. Wouldn't you go back to the exact spot where the weather changed and just hop back and forth? Like, <laughs> autumn, spring, autumn, spring. <laughs> Instant pneumonia. <laughs> Think of the allergies. <laughs> The streets of Kersey seemed deserted. There was also no sign or movement of anything modern, no automobiles or even bicycles. There was no drone of airplanes, no TV antennas on the roofs, and they could see no telephone poles, wires, or street lights. The air felt absolutely still and felt stagnant and humid. They passed some ducks in a stream that seemed frozen into inactivity as if even they were frightened by the uncanny alteration in the very fabric of space. All birdsong ceased, as did the buzz of insects or the rustling of leaves. William recalled, It was a ghost village, so to speak. It was almost as if we had walked back in time. We experienced an overwhelming feeling of sadness and depression in Kersey, but also a feeling of unfriendliness and unseen watchers which sent shivers up one's back. Attempting to control their feelings of gloom and dread, the boys walked through the village and were struck by its shabby appearance. All the houses seemed decrepit and crude. Many were in a state of disrepair. One of the boys later described them as looking hand-built of rough-hewed lumber and timber-framed. In fact, the village was medieval in appearance. The strangeness caused the boys to recheck their coordinates. Perhaps they had wandered into some kind of long-abandoned area, but they concluded that they simply must be in the right place. The boys approached one of the nearest buildings. They pressed their faces to the shop's small windows, which were coated with grime and grease. Inside, they saw what looked like a filthy butcher shop. They saw the skinned and butchered remains of an oxen and found the appearance of the partially carved animals to be revolting. They were green, with mold. They moved on to another house which also had small windows and which also was caked with a mucky film. Inside they saw crudely whitewashed walls and again no furniture. The rooms were cramped and not of modern design. They had the feeling they were in a kind of ghost town one whose residents were hiding, watching, and angry. By now they were thoroughly spooked. They turned and hurried their way out of the eerie village. They climbed the small hill and did not turn around until they reached the summit, which was some distance from the haunted village. But when they turned to survey the village from the vantage point on the hill, the whole setting had changed. They noticed smoke coming from the chimneys, and they heard the peal of church bells drifting out from the town. They thought they saw people moving about in the streets. It now looked like a normal English country town. All three had had enough. A feeling of eerie dread still upon them, they turned and ran. It took several hundred yards for their fear and depression to stop clinging to them. And they didn't want those feelings to return, so they kept going and returned to their base of operations. They told their supervising officer what they had experienced. He double-checked their coordinates and confirmed that they had actually been in Kersey. He also laughed off the boy's tale of a medieval village where a modern town of 1957 should have been. In the years and decades that followed this experience, what they had gone through continued to trouble two of the three men. The other, Ray, decided the best way to cope was to promptly forget the whole ordeal. Hmm. But William and Michael found they couldn't. In the 1980s, they both found themselves living in Australia. They contacted each other and began to exchange letters about what they had experienced that day. For William and Michael, the experience still resonated deeply. They wanted an explanation. They decided to contact the Society for Cyclical Research in London. SPR! SPR. SPR. <laughs> you can hear about SPR Toronto in uh, the Philip Experiment episode. Mm hmm they were put in touch with one of their top researchers, Andrew McKenzie, who eventually made the Kersey Time Slip experience the lead story in his book, Adventures in Time. The story led researchers at the SPR to dig into the history of the village. 
They wanted to find out if this settlement's history extended back into the medieval times, which indeed it does. It is known that Kersey was established at least in 900 AD because the mention of it is found in an old Anglo-Saxon will. Wow. In 1990, investigators invited William and Michael to return to Kersey so they could retrace the journey they made more than 30 years previously. Walking through the streets again, they quickly identified the house that seemed to be the butcher shop, which they had encountered years earlier. It turned out the same residence, or at least the same site, was once a butcher shop. Hmm. Investigators were able to confirm that the house was a butcher shop at least as early as 1790, and that the building had existed in this exact spot at least as early as 1350. Wow. Mm -hmm. One curious contradiction arose, though. An easy view of the butcher shop is the ancient St. Mary's Church, known to date back to medieval times. As a well-known landmark of the town, why didn't the boys see it in 1957? It seems it would be impossible to miss its tall, castle-like spire. But there is an explanation. Construction for the church was abruptly halted in 1348 because of the outbreak of the Black Death. If the boys had time slipped to a period between, say, 1350 and 1400, the uncomplete shell of half the church would have been hidden by trees and brush. By 1420, the plague had receded and Kersey was experiencing a period of prosperity and St. Mary's was completed after that. Others have suggested that the powerful feelings of depression, desolation, and fear the boys experienced were due to the Black Death. It would have explained why they encountered few people and why the butcher shop and the other home they looked into were abandoned. The plague was known to sweep people away very abruptly. For oxen to be abandoned mid-butcher might well be explained by the unrelenting swiftness of the Black Death. The experience of the three boys seemed to bear all the factors of a classic time-slip experience. William and Michael remained convinced more than 50 years after that strange day in 1957 that they traveled to the Middle Ages of England. And the third guy, well... He'd prefer not to think about it. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody has their coping mechanism. (laughs) So many weird details about this story. Like, what was with the ducks? (laughs) And there was the rotten meat, but no other mention of any other foods. Yeah, I don't know if they saw any other foods. Mm -hmm. And the weird I'm being watched vibe as well. Mm. And this is the first story we've covered, which dives into what is called the Oz effect. Right. Where everything goes unnaturally quiet, almost like the present moment in time was caught in a bell jar. Right, right. And for those who don't know, it's called the Oz effect because it comes with the distinct feeling that your surroundings have become foreign. Mm. Sort of like that classic you're not in Kansas anymore sort of vibe. (laughs) Exactly. The Oz effect is actually reported not only in time slip stories, but across a multitude of paranormal phenomena. And always completely unnerving. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a break, dear guest, while we re-nerve our dear Jennifer. (laughs) I'll be at the pub. (laughs) (laughs) When we return, we'll meet a man whose bedtime routine got a little too familiar, (laughs) take a holiday trip that goes nowhere, And meet a grandmother who experienced something denture-rattling from the comfort of her doily-covered recliner. (laughs) Don't lose your place in time. Odd Tonic will be right back. Jennifer and I understand that you have many set tees to choose from, but we sincerely appreciate that you've chosen to join us on ours. (laughs) We certainly do. And we would like you to be the first to know about an exciting new venture. Mm -hmm. We have just launched our Odd Tonic Patreon. Help support your favorite new podcast. And we're offering fun Odd Tonic themed rewards as a thank you to our patrons. We've got keepsakes, t-shirts, signed prints, and more. You can check them all out at patreon.com slash odd tonic. Plus, we have comfortable donation tiers for all levels of support. Or alternately, you can just adopt us directly. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, the Daddy Warbucks contingency plan. (laughs) Love it. That link again is patreon.com slash odd tonic. Go check out our swaggy rewards. Your support will help keep Odd Tonic howling at the moon and making bumps in the night. Now, let's return for more time-tumbling turmoil. Welcome back. 
So far, we've wandered from the middle 50s into the middle ages. <laughs> we've heard a parent repeat themselves in the most bizarre way possible. <laughs> and we've learned that if you're time traveling, don't pack ice cream novelties. <laughs> so true. They're all stories you can replay in your head again and again and still not understand exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, our next account is another from the book Time Storms by Jenny Randalls and is about a man who didn't have to replay a weird story in his head. He lived it. Arthur Four of Baltimore, Maryland, described a strange night in the spring of 1947 that he's never been able to forget. He had been out dancing and at 2.30 a.m. returned by taxi to his apartment where he lived alone, protected by heavy security locks. After bounding up the steps, eager to get to bed, he double-locked the door, threw off his clothes, and collapsed into bed. Yet within seconds of doing so, and switching off the light, he apparently came home again. That is to say, Arthur heard someone bound up the steps two at a time, just as he had done minutes earlier, unlock the door, double-lock it, and then enter the room. Listening in mounting shock, Arthur felt the bed depress and witnessed a complete rerun of himself, taking off his clothes and then climbing in. He felt something press against his body, and it all got to be too much. <laughs> he turned on the light, but silence had returned, and he was all alone. As Arthur reports, he only stayed put because of his certainty that he was experiencing an action replay of his own arrival. Quote, if I did not think the person was myself, I would have made a new door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really admire his level-headed wherewithal. Mm. He only lost his cool when things started to get awkwardly intimate. <laughs> if you're going to have a weird moment, the best you could hope for is that you were there to comfort yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> or if you're not lucky enough to commiserate with your doppelganger, experiencing something strange with close friends is probably the next best thing. Mm, nothing builds those bonds like going crazy together. <laughs> Squad goals. <laughs> Here's a story of four friends doing that very thing from Rosemary Ellen Guiley's Slips in Time and Space. This is another classic story, but full of fascinating details that are typically not mentioned. In October 1979, Lynn and Cynthia Gisby and their friends, Jeff and Pauline Simpson, all of Dover, England, decided to take a vacation together. The plan was to take the ferry across the English Channel and drive through France to northern Spain for two weeks of late summer sunshine. The weather was perfect and the drive through the foreign countryside was lovely to view. On October 3rd, around 9.30 p.m., they were on the freeway north of Montelamar, France, far to the south. It had been a pleasant day, but they were tired, and the encroaching darkness had them looking for a place to stay. Ahead loomed a plush motel, and they decided to stop there for the night. When Len went inside, he was greeted in the lobby by a man dressed in a rather strange plum-colored uniform. <laughs> Crazy. I'm going to picture Elton John greeted them in the <laughs> lobby. But Len presumed this to be part of the local custom. <laughs> Maybe it was Elton John week. <laughs> The man informed Len that, unfortunately, there was no room at the motel. However, Len was told, if you take the road off the freeway there, and he pointed south, then you will find a small hotel. They will have rooms. Len thanked the man. Thanks, Tiny Dancer. <laughs> <laughs> and the party drove on. The last faint traces of daylight still painted the sky when they found the road indicated. As they drove on, Cynthia and Pauline commented on the old buildings lining the roadside. The posters plastered on them were promoting a circus. It was a very old-fashioned circus, Pauline remarked. That's why we took so much interest. The men were more interested in the road itself, cobbled and very narrow. When no other traffic passed by, they began to doubt the wisdom of their plan. But they drove on passed a long border of trees in the dim night, and eventually reached two buildings. One appeared to be a police station. The other had a sign saying, Hotel. Len got out and went to ask for accommodations. He came back sighing with relief. They have rooms, he said. And so the tired travelers unloaded their bags. It was about 10 p.m. 
They estimated it had taken them about 10 minutes to reach the hotel from the other motel. The hotel itself was a curious ranch-style building. It had just two stories and looked quaint and old-fashioned. Because none of the four spoke French and the hotel manager apparently spoke no English, they made themselves known as best they could and were shown to their rooms. On the way, they noticed that the building's interior was just as strange as its exterior. Everything was old and made of heavy wood. Some men in rough clothes sat drinking around one table near the bar. There seemed to be no telephones, elevators, or other modern equipment anywhere. Upstairs in the rooms, the beds were large but had no pillows, only bolsters. The sheets were heavy. The mattresses seemed to sag in the middle, but felt comfortable enough. The doors had no locks, just wooden catches. What? And the two couples had to share a bathroom with old-fashioned plumbing and soap attached to a metal bar stuck in the wall. What? That's it. I draw the line at weird soap on a stick. (laughs) I would be gone. (laughs) <laughs> Jeff agrees with you. Look at this funny soap, he said, chuckling. Smart man. After unpacking, they went down to the dining room for a meal. Although unable to understand the menu, they did recognize the word oof, egg, and ordered four of that dish. After they had drunk lager from tankard supply to them, maybe this is the reason <laughs> things are getting kind of weird. I think it's weird already. <laughs> Their dinners arrived on huge, heavy plates. Included with the eggs were steak and French fried potatoes. No rancid oxen. (laughs) Is nothing consistent in these time stories? Their meal finished, they drank more lager. (laughs) Good advice. Mm -hmm. The girl who served them could not understand English either, so they did not interact. Facing another long journey the next day, they went straight to bed. Morning woke them early. Sunlight filtered in through the windows, which had no glass in them, just wooden shutters. Pauline removed the chair she had wedged against the door because she was afraid to sleep without some way of holding the door shut. Mm -hmm. They dressed and went back down to the dining room for breakfast. This simple meal consisted of bread, jam, and coffee. The coffee tasted black and horrible, (laughs) Jeff recalls with disgust. (laughs) So spoiled by Starbucks. Where's my double pump mocha whip triple shot? (laughs) (laughs) While they were eating, a woman came into the room and sat down opposite them. She wore a silk evening gown and carried a dog under her arm. This is fantastic. I have found my people. (laughs) (laughs) It was strange, Pauline says. She looked like she had just come in from a ball, but it was seven in the morning. (laughs) I couldn't take my eyes off of her. Then two policemen arrived, perhaps from next door, wearing deep blue uniforms, capes, and large peaked hats. They were nothing like the police we saw anywhere else in France, (laughs) Jeff says. Their uniforms seemed to be very old. These were an altogether different type of popo. (laughs) (laughs) Now who's drinking the lager? I wish I was. As they finished their breakfast, they all decided they wanted to choose some souvenir of this unusual hotel to show their friends when they got home. So Jeff took his camera into the room and photographed Pauline standing by the shuttered windows. Len, while out packing his car, took a photograph of Cynthia inside the hotel, silhouetted against the window. He snapped another to ensure he got a good photo. Len and Jeff decided to ask the policeman the best way to take the freeway to Avignon and the Spanish border. But the policeman hesitated at the word freeway and plainly did not know what was being asked of them. Jeff presumed that Len's attempts at a French dialect were just not successful. (laughs) In truth, Len's French stunk. It had always stunk and it would continue to stink and they all knew it. It was embarrassing. (laughs) What have you got against Len? (laughs) The story just makes me nervous, so I tell jokes. I mean, just what is going on here? (laughs) Have some more lager. (laughs) Eventually... No thanks to Len. (laughs) The police understood that the travelers wished to go to Spain and directed them to the old Avignon Road. This seemed a long way around to the two Englishmen, so they decided just to go back the way they had come. With the car packed and everyone ready to leave, Len went across to the manager and asked for the bill. The man scribbled a sum on a piece of paper. It read, 19 francs, about $3. No, no, Len motioned, for all of us. The manager simply nodded. When Len indicated that they had eaten a meal, the manager continued to nod. Len showed the piece of paper to the policeman, 
who smiled and indicated that was correct. Len paid and left. Come on, Jeff remembers whispering. Let's get out of here before he changes his mind. <laughs> that would be me. Len should have slid across the hood and yelled, go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> the day was nice for traveling and the road was empty until they joined up with the larger highway. Forgetting all about the hotel, they spent the next two weeks happily in Spain. On the drive back, naturally, the four decided to stop again at the same hotel. The hotel was unique and... The price was right. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs locks or stickless soap? <laughs> this time, it was raining, but they found the turnoff easily and drove toward the hotel. There are the circus signs, Pauline called out. This is definitely the right road. But there was no hotel. They were concerned enough to return to the motel on the freeway and ask directions. Not only did the man there not know of such a hotel, but he insisted there wasn't a man employed there in a plum-colored uniform who could have directed them there previously. Huh. Three times they drove up and down the road, but there was no hotel. It had vanished into thin air. By this time, Cynthia was upset and in tears. It has to be here. It can't just disappear like that, she said. Somebody suggested it had been knocked down. They couldn't do that in two weeks, not without a trace, Jeff countered. At those prices, they probably went broke, another person speculated. <laughs> they finally gave up and drove north to Lyon and to a hotel there. Bed, breakfast, and evening meal for four, with admittedly rather more modern facilities, <laughs> cost them 247 francs, about $40. Oh, this was still a long time ago. Mm -hmm. huh? The Gispies and the Simpsons were mildly intrigued by their adventure, but it never crossed their minds that there might be a paranormal explanation until they developed their photos from the trip. The three photographs of the hotel, one by Jeff, two by Len, had been taken in the middle of their film rolls, but none of the hotel pictures were printed. They looked at the negatives. Where the hotel pictures should have been were unexposed. Blank spaces. It was as if the pictures they had all clearly remembered taking did not exist. They had disappeared into limbo, just like the hotel. A fashion-conscious friend discussed the uniforms with Len and pointed out in a book that policemen did wear the kind he was describing prior to 1905. What really happened to the four travelers in rural France? Was this a time slip? If so, one wonders why the hotel manager was apparently not surprised by their futuristic vehicle and clothing, and why he accepted their 1979 currency, which certainly would have appeared odd to anyone living that far back in the past. The Simpsons consider these points and have no explanations. You tell us what the answer is, Jeff concludes. We only know it happened. <laughs> and that's really interesting, right? That's the second Phantom Hotel that we've covered. Mm. Once you start investigating time slips, you start to see that appearing and disappearing buildings are, are common. Mm -hmm. And restaurants, too. There's at least that one other story that we know of, right, where mm -hmm. friends had a full and mysteriously cheap meal at a restaurant that they later find out had burnt down several decades before. <laughs> Do those calories count? <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Artifacts, photos, and video taken in these alternate zones are often reported to disappear once the travelers come back to their own reality. Right. And it's right. really interesting. Of course, it's completely aggravating to those who've traveled. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Hey, honey, look at my $500 souvenir I bought during my time slip. In the, uh, oh, oh, crap! <laughs> Pro tip time, travelers, save your receipts, <laughs> which will also prompt disappear I guess <laughs> <laughs> well our last story is one of our favorites mm. it's a shorty but a goody from the spectrum glimpses of the paranormal and encounters with the strange by Justin Bamforth on May 23rd 2018 during Dave Schrader's radio show midnight in the desert a man described a very strange encounter that his grandmother had experienced she had been in her recliner in the living room watching TV during daylight hours, when three shadow figures walked into the room, stopped in front of her, then quickly turned and ran out of the room. Mm -hmm. Now, the plot of land that the grandparents had purchased to build their house on 
didn't have any of the usual associated catalysts that trigger hauntings. Nobody ever died in the house, nor were there any deaths or strange events associated with the property. The house wasn't built on an old burial ground, and everything that was bought for the house was also brand new, so it remained a mystery. A few years later, the grandmother passed away, and the man inherited the house, and he moved in. Two of his friends came over to visit. As the three of them entered the living room, they saw the full-bodied apparition of his grandmother sitting there in the recliner. The three friends stared at her, then quickly turned and ran out of the room. <laughs> now who's really haunting who? <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. All of that, and I think the granny gets more composure points than the three men. <laughs> <laughs> right. Such a good story. Yeah. And, and what's fascinating is you think it's just a normal ghost story, and then it morphs into this time weirdness. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And you know, how many times have you and I seen paranormal categories sort of blur and overlap like this? Mm, it never stops being unsettling mm -hmm. because you think you can at least put a label on something and then you realize you might not even have that shred of understanding. I, I love that we are starting to touch on this type of mixed strangeness. Mm. And we will definitely be sharing more stories like this in the future. <laughs> Bigfoot flying UFOs. No spoilers. <laughs> All right. Well, that wraps up this edition of Odd Tonic. We hope you've enjoyed meandering down these twisting time tunnels with us. And that the past you approves of the present you listening to future episodes. Did you say that right? I may never know. <laughs> <laughs> Remember to subscribe so you never miss a future show. And leave us an iTunes review because that really does make an impact. Mm -hmm. Oh, and be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash odd tonic. Go get some reward swag and feel good for backing the show you love that loves you back. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next week with more weird history, strange science, and supernatural shenanigans. This is, dear guest, goodbye for now. But remember, if your map coordinates ever lead you to an eerily silent, ramshackle, abandoned medieval village where in the gloomy, oppressive atmosphere you sense that you are being watched by unseen eyes, don't worry. It's just us. Good night. Good night.